Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Attitude Magazine's ADHD Experts broadcast. We are pleased to have Dr. Dave Anderson of the Child Mind Institute here to talk with us about helping your children with ADHD thrive while meeting their own challenges. Before we get started, let me note a couple of housekeeping items. Those of you tuned into the live webinar may download the slides now by clicking on the event resources section of your webinar screen. And if you are interested in the certificate of attendance option, look for instructions in the email you receive around an hour after the live broadcast. For those of you listening in replay or podcast mode, you can visit attitudemag.com and search podcast 367 to access the slides, the webinar replay, and the certificate of attendance option. If you support the work we're doing here at Attitude to strengthen the ADHD community, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine for your family or to share with a teacher or a loved one who could benefit from greater understanding of ADHD. And finally, the sponsor of this week's Attitude webinar is Play Attention, Enhanced Brain Health and Performance. Click on the hyperlink on your screen to schedule your free one-on-one consultation to discuss a customized executive function training plan for you, your child, or your clients. For over 25 years, Play Attention has been helping children and adults thrive and succeed. Their program utilizes NASA-inspired technology and is founded on the latest research in neuroplasticity. Each program includes a lifetime membership and a personal executive function coach to customize your plan along the way. It's evidence-based and supported by research. Home and professional programs are available. For more information, call 800-788-6786 or click on the hyperlink, or click on the hyperlink for free ebooks on parenting, executive function, impulse control, mindfulness, and more. Or of course, you can go to the website at www.playattention.com. Attitude thanks our sponsors for supporting our webinars. Sponsorship has no influence on speaker selection or webinar content. Now for today's topic. Caregivers with ADHD. The joys and challenges of parenting vary by family, but one truth is constant. Life never slows down or gets easier when you're busy raising children. For caregivers who struggle with symptoms of ADHD, the magnitude of family responsibilities awaiting organization and prioritization is overwhelming. And while getting all of this done, parents must also keep their emotions in check around their children a tough job for any caregiver. In order to evolve these hurdles, it's important that caregivers with ADHD take the time to support themselves and develop strategies to address the most significant areas where ADHD symptoms affect parenting challenges. Expert Dave Anderson will give us insights, perspective, and strategies to manage this. Dr. Anderson is a clinical psychologist and the Vice President of School and Community Programs at the Child Mind Institute. Dr. Anderson was formerly the Senior Director of the Child Mind Institute's ADHD and Behavior Disorders Center, and he specializes in evaluating and treating children and adolescents with ADHD, behavior, anxiety, and mood disorders. Child Mind Institute school-based programs directed by David Anderson have provided clinical interventions, social emotional skill building, professional development, and workshops for more than 53,000 students, educators, and parents. You can ask questions of Dr. Anderson during his presentation, and we will try to get to as many of them as we can after he is done. So with all that being said, I'll turn it over to Dr. Anderson. Thanks so much for being here today. Thank you, Wayne, and thank you all. Uh, I consider doing some sort of you know thing where I lip sync to what Wayne was reading on my bio, just because it's hard for me to sit by and 
you know, be on camera while these details are being read. A couple extra details that aren't in my bio. And just you may have heard the line that Wayne said about how uh, my first job at the Child Mind Institute starting seven years ago was as senior director of the ADHD and Behavior Disorder Center. Part of the reason why this talk exists, part of the reason why we have talking points for caregivers who themselves either struggle with ADHD or if you're attending this presentation and aren't yourself a caregiver with ADHD, you likely either know, love, or a partner to uh, someone with ADHD. You know, this, this comes from the fact that ADHD is highly genetic. So when you see kids or teenagers with ADHD, um, it's fairly frequent that one of their parents either has, you know, some loading of symptoms of ADHD or struggles themselves. So there's lots of thought that goes into this and how we can kind of support families as a system and not just the, the child or the teenager with ADHD. The other thing I'll say related to things that people wonder about in presentations like this, uh, my wife and I do have two children of our own. They are five and two. So as you'll hear me talk about early developmental stages, uh, I am living that right now. So in terms of the, the outline of this presentation, um, you know, when I think about how we lead parents in, in clinical work uh, through caregiving when they themselves may struggle with ADHD, uh, there's a couple stages. And what I've done is I've prepared nine slides. So it's nine slides, 35 minutes, and then I'm going to start taking questions. Uh, for those of you who uh, have ADHD, struggle with ADHD-like symptoms, what I want to remind you about the slides, I've tried to make each one a handout in and of itself. So you can take a screenshot of it to jog your memory. And then similarly, as, as Attitude is, is so generously kind of set up, you can actually come back here and because they, you've given them your email address, uh, view this presentation any number of times and go to like the six minutes that's either to your child's developmental age range or when your child passes into another developmental age range, as I'm going to talk about, uh, you can come back and watch the next step up. So what I try to think about, at least in, in coming up with this presentation, is what we see in the research about how ADHD symptoms impact the core tasks of parenting. That'll be my first two slides. Then what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to go through preschool age, elementary school age, middle school age, and high school age kids, and some of the ways we see a parent's ADHD symptoms interact with some of the major challenges that we see during that stage, while providing suggestions for all of you who have children in those age ranges around how you can surmount those challenges and perhaps you know uh, have a, a more harmonious relationship uh, with your child. Uh, oh, I think for some reason we jumped to the end of the presentation, but I'm going to go back. Uh, okay. And then you know, finally, as I, I include in, in almost every presentation, you know, as you're thinking about the impact of your own ADHD symptoms on parenting and then at the, or on caregiving, and at the same time thinking about your child's developmental stage, uh, we have to remember that none of us are at our best if we're not in some way caring for ourselves. And so I always kind of end with some slides on that and then some slides to help you think about your own treatment and how that adapts to what we're thinking about today. So with that, here's the first slide on core tasks of parenting. So for those of you who are caregivers with ADHD or who are raising a child with someone who may uh, uh, struggle with ADHD symptoms, I want you to just kind of think about these core tasks. So I'm going to present these, and then we're going to talk on the next slide about some of the research uh, related to the core tasks of parenting and how ADHD symptoms intersect. So what we're trying to do, and again, we're trying to do this in a good enough way, not a perfect way, just a good enough way in any given day. And one of the things I've said during the pandemic to many parents is that what you want to think about at the end of the day is how your kids feel about the day overall and some of the highlights they remember. Not that every moment you were doing all of these things and it was so harmonious. But what you're trying to shoot for at some level or mixture here is to be emotionally available for your children. So in other words, when they're experiencing challenging situations or when they're looking for guidance or when they're experiencing big feelings, you're there, you're present. You're not looking at a screen at that moment and waving them off, saying that you're going to talk about it, you'll be there later. And that's tough to do. It's tough to be emotionally available. It's tough to be emotionally available at all times. We'll talk about how to focus in on when you need to be the most emotionally available. Um, we ask parents to make space for relationship building. So one of the biggest interventions we do with any family where uh, you might be experiencing ADHD symptoms either in parents or in the children or teens, uh, or you're experiencing behavioral difficulties, is we say to people, and this is, this is backed by decades of research, that we want people to spend for younger kids, at least five minutes a day doing something that's focused around some relationship building skills where you're doing an activity that you both enjoy without having too much of an agenda and without trying to give too many directions or have too many demands placed on either one of you. Um, 
you know, with older kids, you're not going to spend five minutes a day, but you might have two moments a week where you do something together uh, with an older child. May not be mutually enjoyable, but the hope is it's enjoyable for the teenager or the older child. And in some way, it just involves helping a an older child to not think that everything that they have as an interaction with you is agenda driven or is about reminding them what they have to do, but is to some degree about just existing together, even if it isn't completely fun. We want parents to be able to plan ahead for problematic situations. We want parents to have space to reflect on what's been difficult for them and their child in the past and how they might, you know, set the situation up for success or plan for it the next time that it occurs. That's incredibly important for parents to have some of that headspace in any given week. We want parents to have some headspace and ability to organize supplies and schedules uh, that are relevant to their child's age range and to think together if you, you know, have the fortune of having a co-caregiver, uh, you know, how you both can divide up the work on that and manage that. Uh, We want parents to be able to keep children safe, to have the attentional capacity to not be distracted to the point where a kid can be safe, whether it's, you know, toddlers in the house and making sure they don't get into cabinets they shouldn't be getting into or falling down the stairs, whether it's older kids and making sure they don't end up running into the street after a ball, or whether it's teenagers and making sure that, you know, we're monitoring appropriately so that they don't end up uh, getting in the car and trying to drive while they're inebriated, for example. Uh, We want to be thinking about teaching new skills and concepts that are relevant at every developmental stage and how people can be receptive to teaching. Uh, Because, you know, more often than not, we hear from parents that as much as you might believe that your child needs to learn something, uh, your methodology for delivering that curriculum is what matters. And maybe one of the things that makes it so that a kid actually listens versus just thinks that they're in line for another lecture uh, that they're going to have to ignore. Um, And then the the last kind of four bullet points here are related to how you manage behavior effectively with any child. It's that for any parent to be really effective, we have to have time where we're catching our children being good, where we're shaping positive behavior, reminding them that there are things they're doing that we think, you know, we're, we're proud of them for. We think that they relate to character virtues or values in our family or behaviors we want to see them demonstrate with other people. When challenging situations occur, we want to do our best to stay at least mildly regulated. We're not going to be perfect. We're going to lose ourselves at times. But the more often we can stay regulated, the better our kids are staying regulated. We want to be able to give clear directions when we have situations where there's an agenda and to be able to follow through, either catching the kids following through on the directions if they do, or if they don't, being able to move to the last point, which is to set boundaries and give consistent consequences. Now, when we talk about caregiving with ADHD, The difficulty that we have, and this is coming from research articles, where if you went to Google Scholar, for example, you'd find articles on each of these topics here, um, which is that if you were to Google, for example, keywords like parenting with ADHD, you'd find articles that include kind of surveys in homes naturalistically, parents reporting what their difficulties are, uh, observations of parent-child interaction, and that these are some of the major things that parents with ADHD will report difficulty with or will demonstrate difficulty with. So... In this sense, if you, if you think about the, the core deficit of ADHD being fluctuating attention, particularly to things that are non-novel, uh, boring, repetitive, things like that, to be sure, raising children is often non-novel, as in it's the same many, many days. It can be boring. It can be repetitive. It can be you know the same tasks day in and day out, partly because part of the experience of growing up is doing the same thing a thousand times and learning how to do it better over the course of time with your parents as a guide to help you stay regulated emotionally and think through new solutions. But that can be tough when anybody's attentional process is impaired or when you're more likely to be distracted uh, or to lose patience around things that are boring or repetitive. So what we see in the research is that uh, parents who have ADHD will say, I have difficulty being available as much as I'd like to be. You know, I get distracted or I get pulled into other things or there are other things that interest me or, you know, I don't find myself, you know, wanting to spend as much time uh, with my child doing this. Parents will report that they have difficulty with monitoring. They have difficulty in making sure that, you know, all the ducks are in a row for a play date or making sure that their teenager is kind of checking all the boxes related to, uh, you know, the spaces they're hanging out in or whether or not it's safe or whether or not they know the friend they're hanging out with or whether or not there are parents there or whether or not their phone is on and has the location uh, that you can track to know that they're where they say they're going to be. You know, for one reason or another, if you're, if you're distracted or if you're in other processes, it can be difficult to keep that going. Maintenance of household routines. 
Household routines are by nature boring. Doing laundry is boring. Now, Gretchen, some of you, there's 649 people right now on the webinar. Some of you may think doing laundry is amazing. And if that happens, you, you are lucky that you find some of the more mundane tasks of life to be uh, interesting. But for most people, laundry and dishes and getting snacks together and making sure kids have clean clothes that are folded into drawers and making sure that they've got all their supplies for their extracurriculars and making sure their backpacks are organized and everybody has a lunch is mundane. And that makes it difficult to kind of maintain focus day after day in the maintenance of those household routines. It can be difficult to be supportive in your response to a child's emotions. Kids often have long arcs in terms of where their reactions to different situations. And so, you know, they don't resolve quickly. And you're often wading through this sort of wave of emotion to pass, you know, as a, a child is kind of dealing with something. And what you wish you could say is, look, just get over it already. But in reality, you're, you're wading through what is a very natural process of dealing with something. That can, again, be difficult for someone who struggles with ADHD. Consistency in many ways is a struggle for parents or caregivers with ADHD. And in that sense, if we're talking about consistent discipline, what can be difficult is if your emotions, your frustration are getting in the way, you tend to go kind of uh, uh, into something in, a, in a, an intense way where you'll try to take away a bunch of stuff all at once. You get really angry and do kind of a big consequence versus what discipline actually is, which is when misbehavior occurs, you really want to give small consequences in small doses so that you're not just kind of using up everything that you've got, but you're also making sure that you know, there's consistent consequences each time a behavior occurs, rather than thinking that one time giving a huge consequence and putting all the kids' toys out on the street are going to make it so that they change their behavior. It'll cause distress, but it doesn't shape behavior. Impulse control can be difficult for caregivers with ADHD. It's because ADHD is by nature, uh, you know, defined by impulsivity. So not overreacting to certain situations, not trying to do the first thing that seems like it'll make things copacetic can be difficult for parents. Uh, organizational skills as well, planning ahead for things, maintaining calendars, uh, tracking materials that different family members need. Uh, and finally, stress management. Um, you know, ADHD comes along with a lot of stress, and that makes it even that much harder for parents to engage in the basic wellness practices or to keep those things up that may actually help to make it so that they're their best selves uh, with their children. So with this, we know that ADHD impacts parenting. You likely knew a lot of these things already if you're a caregiver that struggles with ADHD. Let's talk solutions for at least the next 25 minutes. So if you have children in the early childhood range, their ages two to five, what I've listed on the left, and this is the, the format for every one of the next four slides, and my apologies, this is not novel. You know, I thought about when I was creating this, I should have some like fireworks or a different song that plays as I intro each of these slides. Like I'm a big fan of 80s power ballads. Like this would be something with Phil Collins. And then like the next slide would be Journey. And then like the next slide would be, I don't know, uh, Listen to Your Heart or something like that. But I'm sorry that I don't have that as a, a way of keeping us kind of, you know, really involved. But for early childhood, you know, in terms of focus areas, uh, what you're looking at in ages two to five, is you're looking at building strong attachment with caregivers. You're looking at building, building that bond, making sure that you, know, you have this sense that there is these ways that you take joy in each other and that this person is a consistent source of safety where you can explore the world and move out in it and they will be there monitoring you and taking joy in your achievements and your efforts at independence. That's attachment and bonding. Basic needs. It's that we know that little kids are going to need snacks. We know that they're going to need extra clothes. We know that if there's pre-potty training, which is the early age of this age range, you know, they're going to need diapers. There's a lot of stuff that you just have to kind of bring with you and, and be, be ready with. There's a lot of need for structure and routine. For any of you who've been at home with young children during the pandemic, uh, unstructured schedules do not work well. There's a, a need for kind of predictability and knowing what when snack time happens and for the younger end of this age range when nap time happens for the older end of this age range it's brain rest you know those types of things but you're you're looking to establish those things because that helps the kids to start uh you know engendering conscientiousness and perseverance uh all, all manner of skills they're going to need for later academic achievement and for later structuring of their life uh you need to be able to uh think about safety in the midst of their play so you know, kids ages two to five don't have a lot of tasks they absolutely have to do, but you're looking for different activities they can do either with other kids or with you or by themselves throughout the day where they can play safely. Uh, another major focus area is positive reinforcement. So we want to start at this stage, 
you know, really reinforcing things that we care about for young kids, like independent functioning, like, uh, you know, staying regulated in these sort of challenging situations, uh, being able to, uh, you know, interact with siblings well, or uh, remember their particular routines. All of these need us to draw our attention to their success in them. And finally, there's discipline which at this age tends to be the loss of small privileges or, uh, you know, possibly the, the amount of screen time you're willing to give them at these ages, or it might be a timeout. But it needs to be a simple consequence that's short-lived in the midst of negative behaviors. we got to be able to plan for this. So for caregivers with ADHD symptoms, the, the way that we think about managing these things is that if you're thinking about attachment and bonding, we know that it may be difficult to be emotionally available at all times and to, you know, be, be available for that attachment and bonding. It's scheduling playtime, telling yourself these are the times during the week when I'm going to drop everything and I'm just going to play. Now, if play bores you, it bores you. But you're going to set yourself a timer. You're going to say, I'm going to sit here for the amount of time that this thing takes and I'm not going to do anything else. I'm not going to focus on anything else. I'm going to put my phone in another room. And that allows you to build that attachment and bonding because the reality is kids ages two to five, they don't know that you find their Peppa Pig dollhouse boring. But what they do know is that you're there, you're there for them, and you're building that bond. For basic needs for caregivers with ADHD, we think about basic organizational skills coaching. It's that if you are going to be able to remember snacks and clothes and things like that, I talk to parents about setting up a runway of all of those materials somewhere in the house where basically you got go bags in any given day. And wherever you put snacks or clothes or the equipment they need for extracurriculars, you put it all in the same place. And so basically, you're going grocery shopping in one area of your house where it's decluttered. It's kind of like, here's the snack shelf. Here is the extracurricular shelf. Here's the academic shelf. Here's the you know extra clothing shelf. And you're just leaving everything there so that if you need to pack up and leave the house, it is all in, a, in the same place that actually addresses the fact that you don't have the intentional space to be that scattered. And so for that reason, we have to prep kind of ahead of time. For structure and routine, it helps everybody, whether you're a caregiver with ADHD or a kid, to have a visual schedule. What that means is, and I've done this many, many times over the pandemic with families, is you set up a, you know, especially with kids ages two to five, they're not reading. There's pictures that represent each thing they're doing throughout the day. And, you know, for some families, they've created, you know, magnets or they've created uh, little stickers that you can kind of move around if things go in a different order. But at least at some level for kids age two to five, they can see the sequence. They can see it procedurally what's going to happen. They know what happens before and after. And you can see the timing to say to yourself, okay, here's how I'm structuring the day. Here's how I'm going to get through this and make that structure for them. For safety and play, for caregivers with ADHD, we know that caregivers with ADHD may not be able to monitor children. Uh, as closely as they'd like to in, in any situation where there's play, because for one reason or another, there might be distractibility. There also might be demands from work. You might be checking email, something like that, any number of things. So what I borrow is a term from Montessori and Rye uh, kind of preschool uh, settings, which are yes spaces. It's that wherever you take your child or whatever you set up in the home, make it a space where you feel like they're fairly safe no matter what they're doing in that space. There's not anything high they can climb on, not too much that's sharp, no chemicals. And you're, you're creating that space where you can then say to yourself, all right, I can be nearby, but at least if I get distracted momentarily, this is a yes space. And I know the downstairs you know, area of my house here is something that I'm not concerned about. With positive reinforcement, it is not genuine for most parents to, re to reinforce uh, positive behavior. For most of us, the thought is if positive behavior occurs, that's what's supposed to happen. So now we can take a moment to breathe and this is working out. And if negative behavior occurs, that's when we're needed. That's common. That's good for survival. It's good evolutionarily. At the same time, it's not good for people's mental health or for relationship building. If you want to build a relationship with any human being, it's recognizing their positive behaviors at least twice as much as you recognize the things that they do that are negative. So the easiest way to say to caregivers with ADHD about positive reinforcement is when you're around your child and you're trying to be emotionally available and you're trying to bond, do some play-by-play -play announcing. Just describe what's going on. And from time to time, make sure to tell them what you like about what you're play-by-play -play announcing. I see that you're picking up those blocks. Oh, you're moving the whole thing across the room. I'm impressed with how strong you are to be able to move that. All you're doing is play-by-play -play announcing. If you were to 
join my home on a Saturday morning, what you would hear is what sounds like somebody's announcing the NBA finals, but really we're just talking about two-year-olds and five-year-olds playing and trying to pick out the things we like. Oh, it's really great. You let your sister pick up that toy. It's really wonderful that you're sharing so nicely. Oh, I see you've gone over here and you're grabbing a fire truck. Granted, you do not have to do it at the level that I'm doing it right now. That might also cause many children to turn around and be like, what is wrong with you? You're talking so much. It's more that you think about these little pauses and describing something that's kind of in front of you. The next thing is planning ahead for simple consequences. So as I said before, it's that when misbehavior occurs, like let's say that you decide with kids this age, it is not being safe with your body, and it might be screaming at a really high volume and not using an indoor voice. What you want to build in in your home ahead of time, in your mind, is the idea that these are the consequences I have at my disposal. Maybe it's the loss of some screen time before dinner, and maybe it's a timeout. In the event you give that, you're going to give a warning, and then you're going to give that thing. And it's better to follow through once in a while than it is to just give warnings endlessly because kids need to know there actually is a consequence. And you give that consequence each time behavior occurs. And if you're really going to be a good behaviorist, it's that instead of thinking that one consequence is going to be so emotionally distressing that it's going to cause the kid never to do something again, which doesn't work for any human, by the way, it's consistently applying a consequence and then seeing if the behavior decreases over time. That tells you whether a consequence is working. Now, moving to elementary school ages. Big focus areas. Elementary schoolers are forming their own independent friendships more. So as you get into ages six to 10, you're moving out of that stage where adults are structuring the play dates and it's mainly parallel play where the kids are playing with a toy by themselves, but with another kid. It becomes playing with another kid, playing a board game that is simple, playing a sport that is simple with another kid during these ages. So you're trying to form give and take relationships. You're also developing interests and hobbies. So at this stage, you see kids start to really practice things and start to get good at certain things, whether it's a sport, art, a musical instrument, uh, you know, any number of things. You start to see a real focus on you know, these more complex schedules with more complex activities and materials that are needed. You see increasing academic challenges, particularly for third graders and beyond, where you start to get escalating homework and you start to see the kids have to rely to some degree on their own organizational skills to be able to, to kind of finish their work with challenging projects that are kind of at the edges of their abilities and aren't just about play anymore. And finally, you know, you do see social life. It's still facilitated by parents, but it's not completely run by parents. But for that reason, you know, the parent's ability to keep up with transportation and scheduling demands is a key to whether or not a kid has a social life in this age range. So what we think about in forming relationships, we're thinking about reflective modeling. It's if you want to see your child engaging in give and take with other peers, or you want to see them engaging well with other kids in their music class or on their soccer team, think about what they see at home. Think about what they see if you have a partner between you and your partner between you and other adults. Uh, think about what they see when you interact with your friends. Think about what they see in any television show that they might be watching. Because the reality is that lots of social skills are things that kids have seen others do. So if they've watched a show that taught them some kind of give and take and turn taking in a, in a, on a play date, they're likely to do that. If they saw a parent do it with another parent, they're very likely to see that as something that is going to be a, a part of their own relationships. So we say to parents, you know, you may be struggling with any number of things, but think about the TV show you're putting on for them, what they're watching and what characters they're going to emulate. And if it means making some serious changes related to the public facet of your interactions with others, this is the time to make them. Because this is a critical age for learning how to behave in relationships. The next thing is developing interests and hobbies. So we know that for one reason or another, if you're a caregiver with ADHD, it may be real, really difficult to think about, you know, the, the making space or structuring schedules, something like that, because the details themselves may be really difficult to kind of get a hold of. But what you're trying to make space for your child is how can they practice that thing that they're interested in? How can I give them some, some, you know, whatever materials they need to, on their own, you know, take on the mantle of that practice? For schedules and activities and materials, we know that for people who are distractible, have difficulty with organizational skills or impulsive, it can be difficult sometimes to keep to the same schedule, remember what things are needed for a schedule. So this is the next step up from visual schedules here, which was the earlier stage of development. It's put whiteboards and post-its everywhere. 
And when I mean post-its, I'm not saying you put post-its all over the walls. I'm saying that one of the biggest things that, for example, uh, Richard Gallagher and Howard Abacoff talk about in their organizational skills training curriculum for ADHD is a set of glitches that are common within ADHD. And one of those glitches is the go ahead and forget it glitch, which relates to when something is told to you verbally, we all tend to be overconfident about how well we're going to remember that verbal thing later. And, and this is true of people with and without ADHD. But in particular with ADHD, it's a very, very much often an impaired ability. So the reason to keep post-its or a notepad in every room of the house is to make sure you're not going to forget that thing you need for the groceries or the fact that you're bringing the snack to soccer practice this week or the fact the kid is out of paint for the paint class they've got later or the fact that the schedule is changing on Tuesday and you flipped two of the activities and you're bringing one of the kids somewhere first. It's that whiteboards and post-its are your friend because it's not about shame. It's about being able to remember and making sure that everything in your house is an expression of your own frontal lobe. Now, the next thing is for kids with academic challenges, it's saying to parents, you know, what we're looking for in a way to support them in their escalating academics right now are to look at what your blind spots might be and then to address those for your children. It's that people with ADHD tend to have very cluttered and distracting workspaces. Make your child's workspace as decluttered and non-distracting as possible, free of screens, free of things to fiddle with, or at least free of too many things to fidget with, uh, with all their supplies in one place to make it so they can sit down when they get home, when they're ready to focus, and they don't need to get up to get anything else. And similarly, if you know that they're going to ask you questions about homework, it can be really frustrating if they're always being interrupted or they're kind of running into a place So schedule the time to be able to help them. Say, here are the times I'm going to be able to check in with you so I'm not as scattered or it doesn't feel as disorganized or it isn't about, you know, monitoring both of our levels of frustration as we try to make time for this. And the last thing for social life is that, you know, for anybody with ADHD, um, it's really important to use the reminders function on your phone for things that you might forget. So what I tell parents who are trying to facilitate their child's social life is, You know, if you know that your child's social life is going to be dependent on you sending messages back to other parents, you checking in with other families, or you making sure to do certain levels of scheduling, set a reminder on your phone that says, you know, okay, it's 11 a.m., you know, every Tuesday and Thursday. This is going to be when I send a bunch of texts related to either asking about or confirming, you know, weekend plans with other families or something like that. And you get that reminder and you set like six of them. Make sure it reminds you two hours before, one hour before, 30 minutes before, 15 minutes before, and drop everything when the reminder happens in the hope that you can kind of keep this moving. Because one of the things we hear often from parents in this age range who struggle with ADHD is I feel like I failed my kid. I, I didn't remember this one thing or I missed this detail. And, you know, now they can't have a play date with, you know, Casper. And that's something that we want to prevent if we can, because we want you to have compassion for yourself. And we also want to set up structures that allow you to succeed. So now moving to the middle school age range. So main tasks of this age range. Again, academic functioning is now increasing, and you're taking on even more independence in managing that academic functioning. I'll talk about organizational skills for that. We want to be maintaining positive parent-child interactions, even as there's that push-pull of a kid in the tween years starting to really pull away from the parent and focus less on the relationships they have with their family and more on the relationships with their friends. We want to help kids navigate challenges and transitions that are super awkward, but that also come with this developmental phase, i.e. puberty. Uh, We want to really foster increased responsibility and independence. And here's a big thing. Now, I put screen habits in here because as of a few years ago, we would put screen habits in here as a major thing because many parents would first get a kid, say, a phone during this age range or something like that, like a smartphone. But I got to tell you, you know, as parenting evolves and we look at modern parenting, uh, this screen habits point should probably be pushed early and earlier into development as a way of getting people set up for the screen habits that are going to help them to be able to regulate themselves uh, later on in life. And I'll talk about that. But so in the middle school age range, again, going after the things that might impair a caregiver with ADHD. We know that caregivers with ADHD might struggle with organizational skills themselves. So for kids who have difficulties with academic functioning, it's a really good idea to start looking at org skills curriculums for this age range. Now, your child may or may not have ADHD. They may have some uh, amount of it just because of the genetic loading. But if they don't struggle with organizational skills, the key is for you to read up on the kinds of interventions that exist uh, for this age range. 
and to start thinking about what are really common categories in organizational skills interventions, how you track assignments in a written way, how you manage a backpack and make sure that it is organized, how you make sure you have a folder system for materials, how you plan for long-term assignments, how often you check in with teachers and make sure that you're doing things right or you're completing the assignment the way that you need to. And it's that these skills often need to be reviewed by parents who may or may not have been practicing these skills when they themselves were going through their academic life. But if you're going to teach your kids things to make sure your kids' stars are greater than your own, you want to be reviewing these for yourself, particularly during this age range where teachers are going to start to expect your kids to be able to do these things independently. The next thing is that as your kids start to pull away, as they start to focus on their social lives as the main thing that they're, they're uh, particularly concerned with, what we tell parents to do is really think about cultivating attachment rituals. It's the answer that we say to a kid in the tween age range, what do you and your mom do together? What do you and your dad do together? What do you and your grandma do together? What do you and your stepmom do together? And it's that when we ask these types of things of kids about their caregivers, we want them to have like, uh, you know, one or two answers. Oh, you know what? Uh, my grandpa and I really love to make pancakes together. Uh, oh, you know, my, my dad and I, we, we really like this one uh, restaurant that's around the street from our house. And we're, we're the only ones in this family that really love bagels and schmear every Sunday. You know, we go there and we sit outside. And it's how can you make sure that your kids feel like there's an attachment ritual you share? The reason for this is very simple. As you move into later developmental stages, you want that open space where a kid might have a chance of approaching you with something they're struggling with because they see it as an activity that is a shared part of your relationship and that isn't agenda-driven. is isn't you reminding them about their academics. It isn't you reminding them about college. It isn't you reminding them about you know, their social life or their curfew or the fact that they need to put in an application for that job that you'd like them to get on weekends. It's that they remember that you're there for them and you're there for them to, to talk through you know, kind of challenging things. And that, more often than not, is where you get these big conversations with kids versus what many parents try to do, which is have it at dinner uh, each night and, and say, like, you know, what are you struggling with or how was school or can we talk about these academics? And, and dinner by, by these ages often becomes uh, something that, that people are, are a little bit too kind of tired of the monotony of it being the same, even though it's very important to still have family dinner for a number of reasons, including the research on substance abuse prevention. Um, so. With that, when we talk about the challenges and transitions, what we also want to start establishing in this stage is a non-judgmental presence who has talking points around certain things they might deliver awkwardly, but at the same time, they just deliver them. So what we tell parents is don't wait for your kid to ask you about puberty. Get a few awkward talking points, tell them to bear with you at some incredibly awkward moment, and just drop them. Hey, you know what? I just want to let you know, you know, I know you're 12. We haven't talked about this before, but like hair is going to start growing in some weird places. You're going to start to feel some hormone swings. And you're also probably going to be a little bit worried about where you are in terms of the changes that are happening in your body compared to your friends. Also, I'm here if you want to talk about that. Just want to let you know if it's uh, us going to for bagels and schmear on Sunday, or if it's the bike ride we take, or the walk that we're taking to school each morning, or if it's, you know, when we're playing that board game we like, you know, because Monopoly takes a really long time, you know, we can pause and have a discussion about this. And it's that you want kids to start believing that you're available for those things. And for parents with ADHD, we want to give them a focused task where we say, look, plan ahead for your three talking points, drop them, and then remind them that they can check in with you, hopefully during some of these attachment rituals. Increasing responsibility and independence. We want caregivers to start thinking at this stage about planning ahead for the kinds of social contracts you set up with tweens to be able to say, look, you're going to want to do these few things. Uh, in order to do those two things, here's what needs to happen in our household. You're going to want some spending money. Here's what needs to happen for that. And getting caregivers with ADHD to plan ahead for those things, which we know that planning and executive functioning may not be something that happens. We want to remind caregivers as you move in this developmental stage, think about it. How do you want them to earn spending money? What do you want to be their household responsibilities? How do you want to allow them access to their social life or spending money for their social life based on the, the responsibilities they have at home? And with screen habits, I know I'm probably going to get a bunch of questions when I stop talking in six minutes uh, about this. But bottom line is that, you know, you, you start early. And in this, in this age range, you absolutely need to be thinking about it. But it's that, you know, if you look at screens, it's not so much the research on screens shows that they're inherently bad. It's that screens have trade-offs. You need to be doing all of the key developmental tasks 
you know, working on your academic work, finishing your homework, having face-to-face interactions with friends and family. And then beyond that, the screen time can be, you know, spent. But what we want to really start thinking about at this age range is making sure that there's still face-to-face interactions with friends and also making sure that there's a boundary around sleep. So if you give your child a screen, an iPad, a phone, something like that, you, you want to set up boundaries at this age that those things charge outside the room. They can be password protected, so your parents may not be able to get in there, but they do not stay in the room with people at night. Adults are not good at keeping uh, you know, their screen habits to a minimum at night and often lose a ton of sleep based around screens. You cannot expect uh, either a caregiver with ADHD to be able to maintain good screen habits, and you definitely can't accept kids whose prefrontal cortex may not yet be developed. Last slide on development for high school. So as you move into the high school age range, you see focus areas of spending money, screens, and transportation. These are the main privileges that a lot of high schoolers have, you know, 85% of their fights with parents about. You see the interplay of the social life gaining strength while the family life is being de-emphasized. You see a lot of focus on novelty and risk-seeking in good ways and bad. They want to meet new kinds of people. They also want to try new kinds of things that they might put in their body. So in that sense, we want to really think about how we structure this. There's an increased pace of schedule, which can be really trying for caregivers with ADHD. There's a lot of balance of independence and monitoring. And just to highlight how we actually think about the plan for a caregiver with ADHD in this developmental stage, it's for money, screens, and transportation. You will have 85% of your fights about this. How can you attend and preemptively plan for the positive behavior you might see from your teenager around these things, when they spend money the right way, when they give you receipts, when they actually abide by the boundaries of screen time, when they actually don't spend more on Uber that week than you planned on them spending, when they don't ask you for the car in times when clearly their sister needs to get to her activity or when you need the car otherwise. So how do we attend to positive behavior? And how do we establish contracts around how they will have access to these main reinforcers of teenage independence? The next thing is, even as their social life pulls on them more, to go back to that last slide, attachment rituals morph into these family rituals and routines. Do you guys go to the same place when you go on a vacation each year? Do you camp in the same location? Do you go to a particular relative's house to spend time? Do you always take a picture in the same place each year? Do you always go to the same restaurant once every few weeks? How do you keep those rituals and routines up that allow you access to your teen in kind of these you know, familiar ways? With novelty and risk-seeking, We highlight for parents, and it's a simple talking point, how do you validate that you understand a bit about this developmental stage? Remind your teenager that there are consequences should they engage in behaviors that are off-limits for your family. But then also, and this is a key talking point that's really difficult, and I can talk more about in the questions, how do you also set up a good Samaritan policy? In the sense that you can say to your teen, look, I know that this time is full of all kinds of new challenges, and you're going to feel some pressure, or you're going to feel some attraction to maybe drinking when you're with your friends. I want you to know I'm not okay with that. I'm not okay with you drinking. I don't think you're ready for it. And there will be consequences if I find out that you've been drinking with your friends. But if you ever get in trouble, if someone's too sick, if someone's passing out, if someone tries to get you in a car with them when they've been drinking, I want you to know we have a good Samaritan policy. The consequence will always be less if you call me in those situations. Because I never want you to compromise your safety, and I'm willing to negotiate a lesser punishment of any kind, even if you've gotten yourself into trouble, if you call me when those situations happen. And that's a key point for communication to teenagers. In terms of increased pace of schedule, as I've already belabored on some of the previous slides, this can be real difficulty for caregivers with ADHD. And so in that sense, what we tell caregivers with ADHD about this developmental stage is you may not have to maintain the teen's schedule as much. They may be maintaining their own schedule, but you've got to know when you're supposed to show up. So in order to kind of keep your mind focused on what you need to manage, it's if you need to show up for something that they consider important, whether it's a performance or a sports match or, uh, you know, an academic decathlon, make sure they know that you're bringing all of your organizational skills to bear on showing up in those moments. And I've already kind of talked a bit about the regular review of boundaries and guidelines in the first point about establishing contract, but I also want to highlight that when kids are being independent and they're abiding by your monitoring guidelines, as in texting you when they get to a place, making sure they're in places that are approved, there should be rewards for following your guidelines or your monitoring uh, you know, points. So last points that I'm going to get to about parents before I stop in two and a half minutes here. Um, the only way to be present for everything that I just listed, and I just listed a lot, 
And what I'm trying to do is for any caregiver with ADHD, I'm trying to boil down each of those four developmental stages to focus on this, not that. And if you do a few of these things well, you're, you're bound to experience some successes. But the only way you get there is if you care for yourself. So here's the, the quick checklist. Are you eating regularly? Are you hydrating? Are you exercising to some degree, moving your body? Uh, are you sleeping to some degree the amount that you might need it? Depending on developmental stage, it may be impossible, but we really want people to be able to sleep. Uh, are you reaching out to your own social supports to make sure you have space to vent or to go and grab a drink with somebody or to be able to just say, you know, are you experiencing the same thing and commiserate? Are you also making doctor and therapy appointments? So the reality is we want everybody to have access to medical care and to mental health care if we possibly can, and to make sure that they're keeping their health up so that they can be healthy for their kids, and that they also have, hopefully, a therapist if they need it in order to, to kind of confront some of the struggles they may be experiencing in their life. So those are some of the basic wellness practices we want people to be paying attention to. You don't have to do all of them perfectly. You don't have to do all of them all the time, but it makes sure you're paying attention. And then if you're looking at self-care, you know, books like Mind Over Mood, uh, you know, which is one book around, you know, skills for managing depression. We'll outline some of these skills I have on the side here about how to kind of collect data on your own emotions or schedule activities that you know to be mood boosting, which is behavior activation, or be able to better tolerate distress when it happens and just ride that wave or engage in mindfulness or relaxation skills. You know, books like Mind Over Mood or Russell Barkley's book, Taking Charge of ADHD, can help parents to really take charge of their own symptoms. And, you know, to, to really think about the fact that if you're having difficulty engaging in some of these self-care skills and any of these lists, in other words, if they're happening according to the acronym FIDI, with great frequency, intensity, have been happening for a long time, or they're really impairing your functioning at work or at home or something like that, it, it's, there's no shame in getting help. We want to destigmatize that. We want to give people support they need. And what people often think is going to a therapist would be another thing I've got to add to my plan. When in reality, going to a therapist makes your life more efficient. Because what a therapist says is, focus on this, not that, in the same way that I'm trying to break it down on these developmental stages. Last point I'll make before I pause for questions is that these are evidence-based interventions for adults with ADHD. Is getting medication, uh, getting cognitive behavioral therapy that involves working with a therapist to track data about your symptoms, uh, link your thoughts and the way you behave and the way you feel and figure out ways to optimize those a bit better. Again, taking into account your life history and background. And then possible treatment for any comorbid things from ADHD because lots of adults, for one reason or another, could struggle with depression or anxiety or any number of other things. And then there's also research to support the work on mindfulness and acceptance intervention for ADHD as a way of being able to be more mindfully present or available or regulated emotionally. Some other interventions that are promising, uh, but still need further study, at least for adults, are ADHD coaching, which still needs more systemic, uh, you know, randomized controlled study. Uh, but many people will anecdotally, of course, tell you is very helpful. Uh, Computer-based interventions, which there are, there are many uh, computer-based interventions out there that uh, purport to help with organizational skills, organizational skills, and emotion regulation. And while there is some promising evidence, there's definitely not the level of evidence for the things I've listed in the top category. And then support groups for parents with ADHD, for parents with ADHD whose kids have ADHD, things like that. And so the, the things that I've discussed during this presentation all are ways that you can consider kind of the intersection between your own treatment if you're in a support group, or if you're getting coached, or if you're having cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, or if you're engaging in mindfulness, and, and ways you can bring those skills to bear to the developmental stage that your, your child uh, might be in. So with that, I'm going to pause. Uh, Wayne, I believe you've been collecting questions. I want to make sure I make some time for that. Yes, yeah, somebody wants to ask you about extrinsic rewards. Sure. Um, they've read that they're in one place that they're um, very motivating. And in other places, they say they're not so motivating. So I wondered if you could just sort of give us a lay of the land on extrinsic rewards. Sure. Raising uh, children. So folks, this is where all too often the talking points you hear are oversimplified. Uh, there is a balance for every human between extrinsic rewards and intrinsic rewards. For example, I love doing things like this, where I try to take complex things talk about them in a hypomanic way and throw a lot of words at you and try to get, you know, <laughs> practical psychological concepts to the populace. 
if I suddenly won the lottery, I would still do presentations for attitude, even if nobody was paying me to do this work because I'm intrinsically motivated to do it. It is fun for me to consider problems like that. At the same time, I love treating patients, but I hate the paperwork. The only reason I do the paperwork is because somebody pays me and they won't pay me unless I do the paperwork. So I have to be extrinsically motivated to do paperwork. And we are all a landscape of extrinsic motivators and intrinsic motivators for stuff that we find to be reinforcing. All too often, what we hear in society right now is a demonization of extrinsic motivation, especially for children. And it's doing us a disservice as, as humans. Because the reality is that everyone needs, to some degree, extrinsic motivation. Money is one of the, the biggest examples of an extrinsic motivator. But you know, for any kid, what you look at is where they're developing and where they're kind of developing proximal skills. And you try to think to yourself, okay, in the skills they're practicing, which ones are they intrinsically motivated to practice? Like maybe they love soccer, so they will definitely go and work hard at soccer. But at the same time, maybe math isn't their thing. And so at some level, the promise of, you know, uh, some of their new soccer equipment or the opportunity to uh, attend an MLS soccer match or something like that might extrinsically motivate them based on their interests to do something they're not intrinsically motivated to do. And this is something that we really need to think about as a principle for, for helping anybody. We don't want to over-rely on extrinsic motivation. And, and a lot of the, the research that um, people cite about extrinsic motivation being demotivating um, is flawed. It's research where someone utilized extrinsic motivators, but not in any way that a behaviorist would use it. And so for that reason, concludes that extrinsic motivators are demotivating when in reality, if they were abiding by basic behavioral principles of doing kind of an interest inventory, making sure the extrinsic motivators are specific to a particular task, achievable within a defined period of time, things like that, they'd find that it was much more motivating. So that's where like, we want people to just kind of take that with a grain of salt and try to think about the landscape they need for motivation because it's a fickle thing. Mm -hmm. What do you got, Wayne? Uh, a parent is asking, my child is 10 and he has a lot of strong emotions and it's hard for me to keep calm. How can we help ourselves when they, when our child, you know, he is oppositional and defiant, making us parents feel upset? Right. So look, you know, these, these questions, mm -hmm. you're, you're coming at me with some of the, the toughest and, and most multifaceted issues that we, uh, we go through. But look, emotion regulation is about practice. It isn't about any magic particular solution. It's that for any of us to stay emotionally regulated in situations, and this is common for parents, is that parents will think they were prepared for everything, emotion regulation-wise. And then they get to parenting, and it's a whole new set of challenges, and suddenly somebody who is calm is finding themselves uh, losing it on a more frequent basis than they were used to in their adult life up to that point. So at some level, we want to have a, a certain level of compassion for the fact that a lot of people find it difficult to stay regulated in all parenting situations. But again... It's about practice. And there are certain things that feed into emotion regulation. It's that if you go back to that slide, slide number 11, around caring yourself, caring for yourself, it's that when you do those things, your cup is less likely to runneth over. Thank you, Wayne. It's that when you do the things, particularly the things on the left, your cup is less likely to runneth over. Like I, I know, for example, that I am more likely to feel irritated at my children when I am hungry and lightheaded or when I you know, have realized that I haven't gotten to move my body in a long time, or when somebody's woken up multiple times in the night and I've only slept four hours continuously. These are moments when I'm much more likely to lose it. And then beyond that, when you're in challenging situations, you know, what I find is easiest for parents in terms of being mindful of how they get through it with their kids, and I'm not going to say I'm perfect at this either, is to remind yourself that they're a little human and they know not what they do. So in that sense, when you see the big emotions, uh, or when you see the kind of, you know, emotional sturm und drang, uh, especially with kids under the ages of teenage years, it's that a lot of this is just them testing out reactions and, and you're, you're trying to lead them through the wilderness here. And they don't have a lot of experience with it. They don't know what this is supposed to look like. Now, for the parent who says that their child struggles with ODD, that's true of about a third, uh, maybe a third to, to uh, you know, half of kids with ADHD have significant behavioral issues. And for that, it really requires a practiced approach 
of thinking about the behavioral strategies you bring to bear. It can't just be trying to stay regulated when your child throws really challenging behaviors at you. It's trying to actually shape over time those behaviors to be less challenging. And for that, for example, I'd suggest, you know, at the risk of me belaboring all the points, really looking into, um, you know, present uh, kind of books that you might see by, for example, Alan Kasdan, who's one of the giants in the field here uh, on this, which is the Everyday Parenting Toolkit, where he breaks down uh, his evidence-based intervention, parent management training, for parents in a shorter version of the book, and to talk about how you set up expectations, how you kind of keep yourself regulated, how you reinforce positive behavior, how you ignore minor misbehavior, and how you also provide consequences for severe misbehavior. And that's how we actually treat ODD and help those challenging behaviors to be shaped over time. Uh, Come at me, Wayne. What's the next one? Okay. What are your recommendations for ADHD caretakers with infants, newborns? What are some key focus area symptom management tips for that stage for ADHD parents? Right. It's a tough one. I mean, you know, it's it's true. I think what that parent figured out was my slide started at age two rather than age (laughs) zero to two. And, and, you know, the the thing is... what I'd throw out there for caregivers with ADHD is that when you're looking at, um, you know, the zero to two age range, it's that, uh, especially zero to one, um, you know, when you look at what the predictors are for child development uh, in, in terms of, you know, uh, doing well, for example, like you're looking at very simple things like a kid needing to roll over, a kid needing words spoken to them, uh, a kid who needs to be read to. And it's that, you know, unfortunately, for many parents, whether they have ADHD or not, that phase of development is slow. It involves a lot of sleep deprivation. It involves a lot of very simple tasks that you're focused on that you know, like you need to do tummy time each day. They need to hear a certain amount of words. And so what I, what I throw out there to parents with ADHD is the idea that, A, it's an incredibly trying time. So to have the mental headspace where you're already struggling with ADHD, to be able to be there for your infant child is really tough. So if you have the luxury of a partner, you know, working out a self-care schedule as best as you can is your best way of being, you know, your best self for the tasks of infancy and kind of early toddlerhood. And the other thing is, is these ironclad uh, kind of scheduling things. Like, you know that your child needs certain things, but it is hard to just slow life down to the point of, for example, you know, putting a kid in a blanket and waiting for them to just figure out how to roll and to be really reinforcing during that time or to think that you're saying the right words to them and not to just think about, you know, your own level of sleep. So for that, it's that we're trying to get parents to kind of slow down, care for themselves and think to themselves, okay, if I'm being told these are the four things I need to do, here are the ironclad scheduling blocks where we're going to do those things. And then otherwise, you know, I'm going to congratulate myself, tell myself I'm good enough <laughs> for these young kids and kind of keep living life and just getting through. Right. What's the next one, Wayne? I was just diagnosed that you sort of touched on this with one of your slides, but I want to get into it a little deeper. I was just diagnosed at 53. I'm a single mother with two ADHD children, 13 and 16. What is the best therapy to help all of us with conflict and family dynamics? There is so much choice out there, CBT, coaching, therapy. What do you recommend? Where should I start? I mean, the bottom line is, you know, if you're 53 and you are a caregiver in a family, Start with what you can control the most, which is yourself. That's, that's the first level of care. You know, if it's mm-hmm. medicine with a psychiatrist, if it's, you know, organizational skills interventions, if it's cognitive behavioral therapy, if it's, you know, support for uh, your mood and your surprise at uh, feeling like you've discovered this answer, uh, you know, a little bit of a later developmental stage, it, it's to start there. The, the reality is that, you know, most interventions which extend to the family you know, where you start to think about other family members, uh, they, they can be ruined if the dynamic or the unspoken subtext in the family is that the person who, uh, you know, the identified patient in the family, the person who needs to do some work is not doing the work they need to do. Like, for example, we drag a family into therapy and somebody's just gotten a first diagnosis and they've, they're entirely green to therapy. The, the questions that occur in many of their family members' heads might be, oh, wait a second. Why don't they get a little bit of support for themselves before we all come into it and figure out how, you know, we're going to work on this. So I I would say stage it. It's that you start with yourself and what you tell your therapist, and this is the essence of evidence-based practice, is that you really want to be data-driven. Evidence-based practice is data-driven. It is 
you know, you can go into all kinds of life history, all the roads that led you there at 53, but it's what do I want to change about my life now? How will I know that I've changed it? And how can we track that progress together? You start on that with a therapist, you're bound to see some, uh, you know, uh, uh, really good progress. And then from there, bring it in the stages. If you have a partner, bring them in next. Talk about how you can more effectively co-care give. If you then bring in some more of your family members, that's great. And if your children, for example, have either the same diagnosis or others, getting them help really works. One small caveat, what you all will hear me say many times, evidence-based practice for ADHD for children. If your child is under age 13, most of the work is done with parents. It is not an individual session with the child. It's actually something that is uh, counter uh, counterproductive because many kids will meet with us under age 13, tell us, I'm going to go home, I'm going to be so organized, I'm going to be so focused, I'm going to do everything. And the bottom line is that's based on their relationship with us and the fact they want to please us. But the follow through is just not happening. And it mainly happens because caregivers at the point of performance know how to support the child best. That's where the interventions really work. Mm -hmm. So start with yourself. And I'm sorry because I feel like I'm saying to you, you're not the cause of the problems, but you are the solution. Oh, that was excellent. Really, I think the hour is up now. And uh, thanks so much for being here and sharing your expertise. I learned a great deal. Uh, so Thank you all. I know I talk fast, and hopefully you can go back and watch the recording on Attitude as many times as you would like to make sure to get the nuances of each of the points <laughs> I was uh, trying to throw at you at breakneck pace. Thanks again, Dave. Really appreciate it. Thanks all. And make sure you don't miss future Attitude webinars, ADHD expert articles, or important research updates by signing up to receive our free email newsletters at attitudemag.com slash newsletters. Thanks, everyone, for being here, and have a great day. For more Attitude podcasts and information on living well with attention deficit, visit attitudemag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com.